This is TK Coleman, and you're listening to Small Business Edge by Ceteris. This is the podcast where we deconstruct small business entrepreneurship through conversations with franchisees, passion-based business owners, and other experts, we learn what it takes to succeed. Today's guest is Jane Bonneman. Jane is the owner of Blue Nectar Yoga Studio. Blue Nectar was voted the best yoga instruction in Falls Church, Virginia in 2014. And they are a premier yoga studio and boutique in the D.C. metro area. Jane, thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Happy to be here. All right. I'll tell you what intrigued me as I was prepping for this interview. I looked at your website and I saw your About Me page. And usually when I look at an About Me page, that's kind of like that person's opportunity to make an impression, to flash their credentials, to sell me on why I want to hire them. And yours was quite interesting because you basically took an approach that said, okay, I put my credentials on this page for you to look at if you care about that sort of thing, but let me tell you what I'm really about. And you got pretty philosophical with it. And you talked about how you find meaning in life and what you feel like your purpose is. It was a very spiritual kind of about me page. So I'm really curious to hear what that's all about, how your, how your sense of spirituality or your philosophical outlook on life drives you and relates to what you're doing today. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the best way to answer that is, um, you know, and I, and I never want to sound pie in the sky or unrealistic because I definitely have my feet firmly planted on the ground. In fact, I think many people would probably describe me as very down to earth. But I also truly believe that life is pretty short and I really think it's important to love what you do every day. When you think about how many hours we spend pouring into work or our career versus those hours that come out of raising our children or um, all those other things that we enjoy doing, I think that it's so important to really love what you do and be very passionate about it. I think other people feel that passion and they feel that spark. And so when I decided to open a business or when I think about being a business owner, the the biggest part of it is that we have, in my opinion, come to this place where work has kind of a negative connotation to it. So, you know, people dread Monday morning. And I don't feel that life has to be that way. Um, I, do, I, I live by the, the philosophy that work should not necessarily be that way, that we can actually really enjoy what we do, um, that we can be really challenged Does that mean that there's not drudgery in running a business? Absolutely. Does it not mean that there are meetings that we don't necessarily love taking? No. So when I say boots on the ground and really understanding that's part of any sort of daily grind, but when I think about big picture, you know, I wake up every single day and it doesn't matter to me if it's Saturday or Monday or Thursday, I wake up and I'm doing what I love. And I believe that that helps to also build a team and an energy in the business that inspires folks to step out of their own comfort zones, to move to a place in their life, in their career, in their relationships that is positive and uplifting for however long we get to be on this planet. Mm. I like that you touched on the hardships because one big source of confusion for a lot of young people trying to figure out what their passion is, is the inevitable experience of difficulty, of boredom, and almost any feel, right? You can be a professional baseball player and there are going to be days where you don't feel like showing up to the batting cages or whatever it might be. And, and so some people get to those moments and they say, well, I, mu- I must not love this because right now it doesn't seem very lovable, right? Um, so for you, did you always think this way or did you live a life where you were doing a bunch of things you hated and one day you woke up and figured out, okay, it's about the love. Like how did this play out for you? Oh gosh, that's funny. Was I doing a bunch of things I hated? No, I in fact, <laughs> gosh, I'm grateful to say no, that's not the case. Um, not at all. In fact, I've been really grateful. In fact, I think that's part of the energy that's created the business is seeing all the steps along the way that they've been gifts and opportunities. And even if maybe I wasn't in a job or a role that I loved or knew was my be all and end all, what could I get out of that that was going to 
serve me as a better business owner or what were some skills that I could take advantage of while working in other companies. And so I never saw my other roles. Maybe I saw them as temporary, but I never saw them as something I hated to go to work to. Um, I don't think I, I know that I wouldn't stay in something very long that I hated to go to. And so <clears throat> when you think about um, you know, the hardships or the inspiration that takes you to business ownership, I, I'm fortunate that I, I don't think that I've ever had uh, uh, any role that was that was horrific, but I do see a lot of folks in in roles that they really don't enjoy every day. And um, how do you keep going even when um, you know you talked a little bit about being in a business or owning a business, and you know when it's hard, are you doing the right thing? And the truth of the matter is, it's you have to be realistic as well. That you know owning a business is far more challenging than any role I've ever had um, working for somebody else. It is. 10,000 times more stressful, more challenging, more, um, it drives my creative process. It drives my left brain. I have to sit in front of spreadsheets. And so it really is all encompassing. And so I think that there are, every single person has moments of self-doubt that they wonder if they're on the right path. And so I try to surround myself with people who help me to get out of my own way when I have those moments where I, I wonder, cause I think that's human nature. But at the end of the day, um, actually, I'll tell you something funny. When I left my corporate job and threw myself wholeheartedly into running the business, I didn't pay myself for a certain, a certain amount of time. I didn't pay myself anything for a certain amount of time. And my accountant and financial advisor thought I had lost my mind. But I thought, if I am making zero dollars, do I still love what I'm doing when I get up every single day? Can I, is this what I'm supposed to do? And so I did it. I set a time frame, and I thought, if you take money out of the equation, I'm still in love with the choice that I've made for running a business and being in it. So I guess that that's also a testament that if you, you know, if you're really that passionate and you really are, are uh, you know, take some of the other factors that tend to be driving factors in people's lives, remove those, and just see: Are you still excited? Are you still passionate? Um, I think it's very telling. You know, what's interesting about the, the experiment you conducted with yourself is that you were not just doing it for free, but because you're pouring so much time and energy and, and effort <laughs> into it, you were paying to play. <laughs> yes. You still believed in it enough to keep going. I love that. Yeah. I love that. So let's talk about the business. Yoga in general and Blue Nectar Yoga Studio in particular, how did yoga enter your life? And then how did that transition into you saying, I want to own a studio? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I have been uh, teaching and practicing yoga for almost two decades, mm. and I have been wildly fortunate. I've worked for organizations that have sent me around the world to train yoga instructors. I've worked in amazing studios around the country. Um, so it has been a passion of mine. While I still, while I still had had other jobs or other roles, it was certainly a very important part of my career. I guess you could call it moonlighting, but. Around 2005, if you can believe it, that long ago, um, I started to think about opening a studio. And it was born of the fact that I had been around the world and around the country teaching in different studios and really having some experiences where I would think if they would just tweak this, or just consider that, what would the member's experience look or feel like? And so I started to design my thoughts about what this incredible experience could be in a yoga studio. And as we well know, which I'm sure we're going to get into like the nitty gritty of the, of the business aspect. In 2005, I started to think about that. So I started to put a little bit of money away and started to begin to build that um, base for which I could invest in, in a studio when that reality came along. And so the concept was really sort of birthed in 2005. The business plan birthed between like 2011 and 2013-ish, and the studio didn't actually open until 2014. And so it's been a very long range uh, experience. Uh, if that gives other business owners a framework that I spent three to four years intensively training with very specific yoga teachers in the industry that I wanted to get my own um, technical I guess, experience, a good way to say it, be a really strong yoga teacher. I made sure that 
that that was that was in good working order. I spent a good deal amount of time um, working with mentors and sort of starting to understand the business side of what I was getting myself into. Mm -hmm. I opened a consulting company long before I took on a bricks and mortar rent business because that is a that's a game changer when you have to pay rent and a staff. So I feel like the path has been um, long for me as far as leading up to what is now Blue Nectar Yoga. Wow. You know, okay, so there's, there's so much to say about this. Um, first, one thing that's really fascinating is, is your, your mindset. When, when you were working at these other studios, you would see things that could be improved and you would think about them creatively. Oh, like, I wonder what the customer experience would be if we tweaked that element. For many people, that's usually a source for resentment or for disgust or negative judgment. I mean, because basically you saw something that was wrong with the world. What was it that allowed you to see that and look at that as an opportunity rather than as something to get annoyed about? Mm, that's, a, that's a really good question. I think it's all about perspective and your attitude. Um, it's all about looking for uh, opportunity and solutions. Being a, a solutions person, I think is a really important part of being a business owner. And I never ever, and to this day, I think I even so humbly sit with all those different studios that I've been so fortunate to, to teach in or work at or be a part of because I also believe that those owners were doing the best they can, that they, I understand they had probably so many balls in the air. Maybe that was their vision and mm -hmm. my vision was just different. So I have the most humble respect for any other owner, but in those experiences, I started to really think about um, a solution to some of the challenges I was seeing in different yoga studios. And you know, rather than, I think, like you said, to be uh, resentful about that, I saw a niche in the market. I, I like that, I like that. And, and it requires two things. On one end, you have to see, see something as an opportunity, but then you kind of have to respect your own intuition enough to, to be willing to bet on it, right? Like, oh, I'm yes. not. I'm not crazy. It's easy to kind of dismiss our own ideas and say, oh, if this was good, somebody would have already done it, right? Yeah. Yeah. To add on what you're saying, um, you know, something that I, 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 I teach when I, especially when I work with um, my team and I work with clients and I coach clients, that you can put all the best plans in place. You can have your financials in place. You can have your mission in place, the most perfect business plan. The theory of your business can be ready to go, but there is a gap that's a leap of faith. And so that's where it really, you stand at that precipice. And just like you said, like, is this going to work? You know, it's 3 a.m. I'm not going to lie. Early in the business, there was a lot of prayers. And so, <laughs> but there is that, there's that period of preparation that I highly encourage every entrepreneur, um, you know, maybe they get to the altar and they realize, you know, maybe this isn't the best idea. That's also a wise decision. There's nothing wrong with saying not here or not right now. In fact, that's a, that takes a lot of guts and wisdom. But I feel like when entrepreneurs get to that place and they've put all their ducks in a row, you cannot take away from the fact that there will have to be a leap of faith. Mm. I like that metaphor. You said when they get to the altar, maybe they realize. Uh, and as you and I know, one of the hardest things about that altar is, is the part of just getting up and making your way to it, right? <laughs> so what, what if you are in that stage where you don't even have all the ducks in a row, you're not ready for that leap of faith because your theory isn't together. You just know that this is my passion. I want to own a business in it. How do I get started? Yeah, that's such a, such a good question. <laughs> I think that once the entrepreneur bug beats, bites some people, uh, it's real. It's, uh, they can't look away. You know, like once you know, you know, you know where your heart is going or you know where your gut is going or maybe you, um, you just have that instinct. You, you start to feel that. And so with that, I think that, you know, folks who are kind of in that stage of knowing, but that stage of uncertainty the leap from being a really skilled technician in your industry, working for someone else, is very, very different than making the leap into owning a business in the industry. Hmm. In fact, just this afternoon, I was talking to someone very casually, and he asked me if I still teach yoga in the business. And I said, yes, because I never want to forget why. And I'm passionate about it. But 
I've had to be real and I have a great manager who helps me manage this at times that even though my love really is working with clients and teaching yoga, the vast majority of my time is actually spent on working, um, working on growing the business. And so it's, it's sort of that leap of, are you willing to leave that passion of being a technician in your industry or a, you know, a skilled person in your industry to really shifting your skill set at times where you are probably doing very little of that. Um, I'm doing very little of teaching yoga compared to what I did leading up to opening a yoga studio. So I think that a great thing for people who are sort of sitting in that space is to get real and really uh, ask themselves some hard questions and answer those questions. Take their time. There's just no rush. Um, and just be certain that making that transition feels good and really is the right decision. That's a really informative insight, too, about how you, you, you were teaching yoga, but then you had to go through a period of time where most of what you were doing did not involve directly teaching it, <laughs> but, but managing and marketing all the things necessary for other people to be in a position where they could teach it. And I guess that's, a, that's an important element to touch on in doing what you love and finding your passion. Sometimes that means being willing to work around it rather than directly engage it. Let's talk about the yoga studio. I live in LA, tons of <laughs> yoga studios. I mean, they're, you know, everywhere you go, every block, there's a new yoga studio. I want to know what makes your yoga studio unique? What problem are you solving in the marketplace? What are you doing differently over there at Blue Nectar? You have hit first off the nail on the head that I sit on the uh, advisory council for the Association of Fitness Studios. And just this week, we had a meeting with the team and talked about some of the saturation levels in the market. And when we opened Blue Nectar Yoga Studio, we took about 12 to 13 months to research commercial real estate. And then within about six months, about four other yoga studios opened that we could basically hit a rock with. And so that's unplanned, right? That wasn't in my business plan. And so um, what do you do? I listened to Magic Johnson speak. And he said, your competition can make, your, make you great. That is a choice. And so as we stood out front and looked around and I turned around and walked back in, I said, well, I guess our competition is going to make us great. It's going to make us um, get clearer and make us move at a pace that maybe we weren't prepared to move. And so, yes, the market is saturated, but how do you want to look at that? Do you want to look at that as an opportunity to be really great at what you're doing and to get so crystal clear um, on your mission and on your goal and who your avatar or your target market really is, who you're serving, or are you going to let it defeat you? And so um, I think most importantly is, is accepting that you can't be something for everyone. And I will say that there have probably been moments of fear in our business where, you know, we would put programming in that maybe didn't fit our mission ideally. And I'm really proud to say that we, we come back again and again and just strip it back. Like, what's our mission and who are we trying to serve? And let's be okay with that. Let's be powerful in that space. And so when you think about um, Blue Nectar Yoga, really what Blue Nectar Yoga is, is our, our tagline is yoga without attitude. And yoga can be... First off, it can be very esoteric. So it can be a little bit out there and a little bit daunting for folks who have never tried it before. Um, trying anything new or being a beginner is pretty uncomfortable for most of us. And so thinking about the folks who the esoteric pieces are pretty daunting and, and uh, being new is pretty daunting, but also yoga can be very elitist. And you know, living in the Washington, D.C. area, I feel like uh, this is a go, go, go. Um, power area, power driven area. I, I can state that with confidence. And so what would it actually be like to have a welcoming, warm environment where the pretense gets dropped at the door? And so our programming, um, you know, our beginning classes are called Rookie and they pack out and we have, you know, it was funny. I was sitting there one day with a new member and watching a classroom empty. They're like, there's a lot of men walking out of that room. And so I think that when you think about 70% of yoga is, you know, about 70% is women and our studio is sort of tipping that a little bit and pushing that statistic. I think first and foremost, that's telling us that we are, you know, dropping that attitude and being welcoming and warm and open. You know, you don't have to be the strongest or the most flexible or any of those pieces that I think sometimes can overwhelm people. 
And we've done what we say very true to the yogic tradition, but we do offer some fusion like TRX yoga fusion um, to keep people's programming spicy and exciting. But we also look at the whole person. So when we think about yoga without attitude or the stressed out culture that we live in, we really try to stay in our lane and create programming that is really truly serving the those needs of the population. And from the moment that folks walk into our front door to the moment that they leave, so many members have echoed back to us our mission statement and they don't even know our mission statement. We don't publicly post our mission statement. We are now actually five years in, we just redid our website and our mission statements on the front. But you know, or you start to feel confident that you're doing something right when your members are echoing your mission to you and they don't actually see those words written on paper. How did you come up with your name? (laughs) Um, You know, I can't take, at the time, I had a great partner and uh, he and I were sitting there um, playing with names and um, the, the blue and the nectar have a lot of meaning to it. So when you think about the color blue, um, the color blue energetically, it counters chaos. It is more ethereal in nature. So the color blue actually has a lot of representation and then nectar is the sweetness within. And so pouring the two together um, became blue nectar. And when you walk in the front door, like we strive to counter the chaos that's outside the door. Um, We strive to help folks look, look within and find that, that stillness that really exists within regardless of when they walk out onto the streets of Northern Virginia and Washington DC and it's crazy and hectic. Our name embodies that vision And everything about our studio is built around that. And so our studio names are Ocean Cruise and Blue Chase and Still Waters. And you'll find different shades of blue because it is a very cool and calming color. And it is also very neutral for most people. Um, It's not speaking to the masculine. It's not speaking to the feminine. um, It's speaking to everybody. And so um, most of our members affectionately just call us blue. It's kind of like just you know, that, that's their thing. And it's kind of cool to see your community create this uh, little um, hook or however they refer to you as their home, their yoga home. I, I, I love that. F- finding the stillness and the, and, and the chaos. L- let's talk about that as it applies to running a business. One of the easiest things to drop, to lose control of when you're living that entrepreneurial life, especially in the earliest stages where you're not paying yourself Maybe you're working 60, 70, 80, an amount of hours a week that you never admit to anybody. You're going through that stage. Well, I'll go jogging another day. I'll do yoga another day. Uh, I'll just get some fast food right now. Uh, I'll meditate another day. I'll read another day. How do you make space for the things that cultivate a sense of wellness when your schedule says, I don't give you permission? (laughs) Yeah. I'm going to start by saying that I am human, just like the next person uh, (laughs) sitting next to me. And I would love to say I do it right all the time, but that would be an utter lie. But what I have found is that when I start to let self-care practices fall by the wayside, I I, I start to hit the tipping point of being burnt out, Mm. not as creative, and relatively ineffective at a high level. And so I've learned through the years, um, through trial and error, that while we might think that push, putting your foot on the gas pedal and not letting up is the best, you know, it's the shortest point from A to B, what I found is it is, but when you hit B, you crash. And so C isn't even like reachable because you're exhausted. <laughs> and so the hours that you're talking about are very real. The schedule that you're talking about is very real. And I think also as a business owner, you know, I'm writing an article right now called Sweat Equity. And um, sweat equity is more about just putting in the hours. As a business owner, you're sweating at times. Like there's a lot of stuff to sweat about when you, when you open a business. And I feel like it's important to not have smoke and mirrors. Be honest about what that looks like. Um, share that experience with other business owners so they feel like they're in it together. But I have, I have come to some self-care practices that now at this stage in the growth of the business and for where I want to take the business, I know that that could be so all-encompassing and overwhelming that I have to commit to certain things to create balance in my own life. I don't, I don't miss workouts. Um, I do get up early and 
before my little one gets out of bed, I spend a few minutes drinking coffee and reading a book quietly. So my day starts um, quietly whenever I can. And they might seem like little minute things, but if you can sneak in 30 minutes of reading and drinking a cup of coffee that like sets your day on a path, um, or if you swear by the fact that I don't start any meetings, you know, if necessary before 930, because my workouts are so important to me because they're shaping my efficiency the rest of the day and the rest of the week. I start to, I started to shift my, my thought that, you know, Yes, I can still pull you know, some really long hours, that's for sure. But I, I, at this point in my life, I refuse to let the self-care part go. And I would encourage um, business owners to consider that as an important part. Um, but I also feel that owning a business in the wellness industry it's so inauthentic as an owner if I'm blogging and writing and I'm not practicing any of these practices. Um, how is that real and true if I'm you know, speaking to my clientele or my client base about creating this balance, but I am not working on it in my own life, I think that people can see through that. And so I have thought to be authentic, I really have to be walking this walk. That's, uh, you, you, you've dropped a lot of wisdom on, on this, uh, this episode. I can't wait to read that Sweat Equity article when it comes <laughs> out. Uh, for those who want to follow you, whether it be on social media or your website, where can they find out more information about what you're doing? Yeah. So um, I guess a variety of different places. My personal website is janebonneman.com and of course, bluenectaryoga.com. And then on social media, I'm just Jane Bonneman. You um, can find me on LinkedIn and Instagram. I'm also an ambassador for Athleta in the Northern Virginia Tyson's Corner location. So I do a lot of work with the Athleta organization. It's a really uh, powerful partner as far as supporting women uh, in the world. And so you can also find me doing work with Athleta, doing work with the American Council on Exercise and with the Association of Fitness Studios. So um, any of those places you can find and connect with me. Excellent. Jane, thank you so much for talking with me today. This has been fun. My pleasure. Thank you so much. For added insights and a full collection of episodes from Small Business Edge, visit ceteris.com slash podcast.